going to start with um, the data assumptions page, which you can find, and I'm showing you the cloud version of the program um, in the settings section. Uh, if we open that, you'll see the assumptions in the menu. So when I click on that page, I get my assumptions and settings. Now you can find the same assumptions page in the reports, more reports. And if we go to the lawyers page, here is the assumptions um, on this page that you can get to and it's the exact same page. So as is often the case in Windows programs, there's sometimes more than one way to uh, get something done. So here we are on the assumptions page. So let's go through all these settings one by one, learn what they are and how to use them. So number one is the start year. This sets the tax year for child support and any other tax impacts. Um, and it will generally be the current year. If you are doing a support calculation, let's say for a prior year, you will want to change that start year. So if I was doing 2020, I would change it to 2020. What I would recommend if you are going to do that is to go to either in the desktop programs, files and settings, open save and do a save as, or if you're in the cloud program, you'll go to file manager and in the list of your files. So I'm in the sample file. I will go to action and I will click on the three dots and this will allow me to copy, which is a save as um, to make a copy of the file. So I have a 2020 copy, 2021, 2022, if in multiple years. If you're only doing one year, then I guess it doesn't matter, but it sometimes helps to know that you are saving for a past year because this setting will change the taxes and um, therefore not only child support, but projections and things like that. Okay, so then the next item on our assumptions list, number two is the number of years for cash and net worth projections. So there are a lot of projections that you're able to do in the file. Even something as simple as looking at the benefit payments on a pension out um, into future years, you may wanna go up to our maximum number of years, which is 50, or you can save for any number of years from one to 50. So if I go report, and I'm going out 50 years, it's gonna show me 50 years worth of the budget report. If I change it to, let's say five years, and I go back to the budget report, now I'm only showing five years of budget. Um, and the same with any of the other reports, few added taxes, um, et cetera. So on the assumptions page, you can put how many years you want to go out for the reports and also for projections that we'll look at later. So I'm gonna set this for 50 years right now, or actually I'm gonna set it for five and then later I'll go back and set it for 50 years. Now the next item, number three, is the last year for personal tax provisions of the 2017 Tax Act. That is the 2017 Tax Cut and Jobs Act, which is going to sunset after December 31, 2025. Um, let's just wait and see what, if anything, Congress does. We've set that up so that it would make it easy in the future to uh, change that um, situation when and if Congress acts, we'll see what happens. When you're doing projections, however, um, it's gonna assume that that act ends 
in 2025 if you think in your uh, professional opinion that it's going to go out farther, then you will want to change that um, so that your projections are accurate. Okay, now the next item, number four, is the inflation rate. So um, our anonymous attendee who answered that, who asked that question, does it factor in inflation? Yes, it does. And the inflation rate you can set here. If any, if you have questions about any of these settings, it's always helpful to go to the blue help um, question mark, and it will give you this information. So this will tell you that we update the inflation rate once a year based on the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office projections of inflation over the next 10 years. So um, that will change at once a year. It did just change to 5%. Um, that's the projection for the next 10 years right now. One thing to know is that if you have a file that you opened, let's say last year, it's not gonna change this rate within that file. Otherwise, all your projections would suddenly change. So if you want to change it to bring it up to date, you can do so. And you can always look up the Congressional Budget Office projection of inflation for 10 years. And if you just Google that, it'll take you to that information. Okay, um, now, the next item is a default mortgage interest rate. So you certainly can put in the interest rate when you enter a mortgage, if you know it for a particular mortgage. If you don't, we will use a default rate. And again, we can click on the question mark and see how we arrive at that rate, what rate we're using. This rate updates monthly again, that would be for new files, but if you um, open a file, it's not gonna change in the middle of your work. Um, so you can be assured on that. And if you wanna change it, you can always change the interest rate when you create the mortgage. So if you don't put in an interest rate for the mortgage, this is the default rate that will be used. Our next two items, items seven and seven, are for how to allocate new assets and debts being entered into the program. You can check one or the other of these items. Now, you may note that when you go into enter data under assets and liabilities, there are data entry options for the page. And within those data entry options, at number three, we have the default allocation of items. Again, 50-50 or by title, just like on our assumptions page, where we ask for how new assets are gonna be allocated. If you don't choose either of these, then there won't be any default allocation for the assets as they are entered. And you would enter, you would allocate them either from the divide property worksheet or individually. Okay, so this um, is repeated elsewhere in the program. And the next thing on this page, you will see report column headings. So what we're gonna do is use initials. Um, the party's initials. So in this case, we have Taylor Allen and Blake Allen. So it's T-A and B-A. You could change that. And if you click on the question mark, you will see what our um, reasoning is for what this is going to be. We're going to identify the title holder as using the party's initials. If you had Taylor and Tom, so they both had TA initials, then 
we would use the first five letters of their first name. And you can always change what is chosen um, by overwriting the information. So if I wanted it to be T-A-Y and um, B-L-A, let me uncap that, B B L A. we could do that. And now that's what is going to show up as the column headings. Um, of course, we used to do husband and wife, but that doesn't always work anymore. So we've gone to initials. Um, and if they have the same initials, then we have to uh, find other ways to do it. So that's why we can have the overwrites there. Now, the next um, set of information is rates of return and borrowing costs. And this is on accumulated savings. This is not necessarily the rate of return on the assets that you're entering, but on what is going to be kept in and in the estate of each of them after the divorce and reinvested, so to speak. Okay, um, Suzanne said, I suppose, I thought we weren't supposed to change the blue areas. You generally aren't. There will be an override or an overwrite. Um, this will um, change the data later in the program. The initials aren't going to change any ca calculations. So you're safe in changing those um, if you need to in any particular case. You don't have to. We can go back to the um, default information without any problem. Okay, so rates of return and borrowing costs. What we're looking at here again is accumulated savings. If we click on the question mark, you will see that this is for um, accumulated savings. It doesn't affect returns on assets that currently exists, you will specify those returns on an asset by asset basis where the asset is entered. So if, for example, in enter data, if I'm entering an asset of, close the data entry options, and I'm going to enter the rate of return on a um, S&P 500 index, I'm going to go to more info and then I can enter the annual income and the rate of appreciation here. So I put in annual income or I can enter a rate of return and it will then automatically calculate what that was going to look like. And you can even enter it for an asset different amounts and overwrite again, overwriting for future years. And that will impact calculations. Uh, so don't do it unless you intend to. Okay. So now let's go back to our assumptions page and keep going. So here for rates of return, we have interest, we have dividends, we have capital gains, and tax-free income rate of return. Um, so because our program um, uh, rounds, we might have a very small rate of return on a tax-free rate, but you can put that in. Um, and it will, again, do what is the amount um, as, and we can click on the question mark, to see how it is calculated, okay? And so now we have the total pre-tax return on reinvested accumulated savings, which is all of these together. And the next item is interest rate on borrowing to cover excess spending. So again, we're gonna look at future spending this isn't borrowing on an existing debt, but this would be future borrowing to cover excess spending. 
And again, I can click on the question mark and have an explanation of what that entry is going to do. Okay, just going to check here. Um, the next item is the partial initial year. You want to be careful about this because it will change the first year um, because the program will annualize the information. So click here for more detail. If you're gonna do this, please read through this detail to understand how that partial year setting will impact your calculations, all right? And then understand that that setting applies only to items after it has been set. So um, we're gonna sort of mess things up if you don't know exactly what you're doing there. And if you wanna do that, then you're gonna X to start the first year mid-year and you wanna enter the month and day to begin the, the partial year. So if I said it was gonna be seven, one, whoops, seven, oh, one, um, then it's going to give me a partial initial year, which will be the second half of the year. But again, use this with caution. Okay, I'm gonna take that out so I'm not impacting my data here. The next item on our assumptions is state and local tax rates. So I can click for state tax rates for the parties. And when I get that link, I see that I am setting it as Illinois. If I had set different um, years, or I'm sorry, different states for the parties. So when I enter data, if I go to parties and children, and let's say one of the parties does not live in Illinois, uh, we'll say that uh, Blake is living in Arizona. No, let's pick a state with a good tax, California. And now I'm gonna go back to where I just was in the assumptions, state tax rates for the parties. And you'll see we have the Illinois tax and then we have the California tax. And California tax is much more complicated, um, but it will all be in there. Now in certain states, like Illinois, we exclude some income from state tax. So I can click on this link and I can say, so an Illinois pension income is excluded from state tax. So I'm gonna exclude it. And um, for uh, Taylor, but for Blake, I am not excluding it, but apparently social security income is excluded from state tax in California. So his is excluded, okay. And so some of that is preset for you. Some of it you can manually set. So that is the state tax for the party. And um, if there were a local tax rate, you could enter it there as well. Um, so if I were going to New York, for example, where there is a local, tax for New York City, um, you could enter it there. Now, the next set of assumptions has to do with covering liquidations and future down payments. So I'm gonna click for alternatives and I have a bunch of settings here for how I want to deal with down payments and liquidations. So first for down payments, how are we gonna cover those? Are we going to sell assets? Are we going to distribute from or IRAs or 401ks? And I can select any or all of these, and then it will take them in order. I can also then select how I want to cover expenses in excess of income, which require liquidation of assets. 
assets to pay those expenses. So again, we can um, use savings, we can sell investments, or we can distribute retirement account money. And you can set which ones of those you want to apply for your projections. This is not gonna uh, impact a current year calculation. It's only going to impact projections. Okay. And then we have some other information here. What's, what term do we want to use for alimony? So the federal government still calls spousal support, spousal maintenance, whatever your state calls it, the feds still call it alimony. Some states still call it alimony. Some call it spousal support. Some call it spousal maintenance. Um, in Illinois, we just call it maintenance, but it is really technically spousal maintenance. So what terminology are you going to use? And then we have in our assumptions case information for the specific case where you can put in the case number and the court, and that will flow through to things like the affidavit, financial affidavits, and so on. Okay, so that's our assumption. Oh, we're going to also look at when entering data, um, we're going to um, know that in the more information fields for assets, liabilities, income, and expenses, you are able to put in information that would change what happens on projections. So here we have personal item, but we want to say what's going to be kept. Is there um, a lien against the asset? What's the tax basis of the item? If there's going to be a tax impact, uh, I don't generally have capital gains on cars unless they're investment vehicles. Um, but you can put that in, um, in another asset that might be more important, like on real estate or um, in the business interest. In income, you can also put in information. So if I go into income for Taylor and I go to more information, I can put in the... Um, rate at which Taylor's wages will increase each year until retirement. I can say not at all. I can say the same as inflation. Remember, inflation was something that we set in the program or at a certain rate for a while and then leveling off, not increasing anymore. And also, you're going to enter the age or the birthday and the date at which Taylor will retire. So then the program will automatically calculate those things. Um, you can also enter a start year for income and when it's going to end. So here, enter the year wages will start being paid. So for example, if you think Taylor isn't going to actually start working for two years, we can enter 2025 and then there will be zero income from wages for Taylor for two years. And then the $25,000 we projected kicks in with the increase based on the assumption that I did about it increasing the same as inflation. If I said not at all, then this projection would take us and show 25,000 each year for the next five, for the next three years after the first two. Now, if I had 50 years of projections, you would see 50 years worth here of that increase. So all of these items are going to go into what we're going to talk about next, which is projections. So projections will show the impact of debt payments, excess income over expenses, shortfall of income over expenses, the liquidations needed to pay expenses and the assumptions on how these will be treated. 
So those projections include, again, all the assumptions on the assumptions page and the assumptions in the individual assets, liabilities, income, or expense. So now let's look at what we have in the program in the way of those assumptions. If I go into reports, and let's go into more reports, and I'm just going to take us to the graphs page first. We have graphs that will show projected net income after expenses and taxes. And one line here, the green line is Blake, and the blue line is Taylor. And this is going to show us out five years. And here you see Taylor starting to go down and Blake starting to go up. Huh, wonder what would happen if we went out more years. So let me go back to more reports and I'm gonna change the number of years to use for projections. And let's go out 50 years. Okay, and now let's go to that same graph, projected net income. And you see here is Taylor and she is the blue line. And you're going to see her sticking close to like zero. And then finally kind of going up a little bit at the end. While Blake's projection is to go way up. And then here, I'm going to assume that's retirement. His income goes down, but then it goes back up again. So if I were representing Taylor, and I wanted something that was more of a 50-50 kind of split, especially in a longer marriage, this might not make me happy or make my client happy as a settlement. So it does help to look at these things, even if you're not a financial planner. And we can do the same thing for projected net worth. Now, for these projections, I like the visual, the graph, because, of course, that's easy, easier for us um, as lawyers and um, uh, visual learners, those of us who are, to look at those things and say, oh, I get that. But for the nerds among us who want to see the numbers, here we go, projected net income after expenses and taxes. It's report number three on the floor plan for planners page. And this will give you all the numbers that form the basis of the graph that we just looked at. FLS for lawyers or for planners is no different at all. We just have on more, more reports, we have two pages, actually three, for lawyers, for planners, and graphs. And these are just um, uh, arrangements of the reports to make it easier, hopefully. Um, and the lawyers page are the ones that lawyers tend to use more often. And the planners page, it tends to be more detailed. Also on the planners page, you can select multiple reports and print them as one um, PDF or one document. And in the um, configuration settings, you are able to set report options like a cover page and a um, uh, graph with reports, background page, a table of contents, all of those things. So planners often like to do booklets of reports and lawyers tend not to, but you certainly can. And there's no reason not to use all of what we have available, whether you are a lawyer or a planner. Okay, so you can do the projections with numbers or graphs, and we have all kinds of reports that will help you um, look at income going forward for um, the years, both in dollars, in number uh, tables, and in graphs, okay? So 
that is our webinar for today.